Hi, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. I'm Dr. Brad Reedy. Today is Tuesday, June 18th, 2024. For those of you that might be new to this format, every other episode is a live Q&A with our, with our current and alumni uh, family. So this one specifically is a question and answer for siblings, family, and friends. So you're always welcome to ask questions for and on behalf of your, your family members. You're also welcome to invite your family and friends to attend this one if you are an Evoke alumni. So before I get into the first pre-submit questions, you can submit live questions at any time. And Maddie, who's moderating for me this evening, will collect those and then pass those on to me when there's time in the broadcast. I just want to give a pitch for the Finding You. I, I know it's, I talk about, at the beginning of every episode, I talk about one thing. And if there was one thing that I think would make the biggest difference in somebody's life, it would be the work that we do at Finding You, principally, understanding how your background, your family of origin, the, 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 the stuff that made you who you are is showing up in your present day life. In, in terms of parenting, it's the number one predictor of your ability to provide a secure attachment, which is the number one predictor of a child's well-being is the, the quality or the security of their attachment. And that is how well you know yourself and how well you know specifically your early, early childhood history. So this is not a, an educational course. This is not something where you're going to come in and just sit in classes and then take lots of notes. This is a small gathering, seven participants, where you're really doing psychotherapy in a group setting. It sounds intimidating. It can sound intense, but invariably people talk about this being an absolutely life-changing experience. If you're new to therapy, it's a great place to jump off into your work. If you, if you hear people talking about, if you hear me talking about doing your work, this is a great place to identify your work and to get started. If you are a, a regular participant in psychotherapy or 12 steps or any other kind of group, this is a great accelerator. In, in, in a sense, this is a five day, four and a half day program that, that produces what I would say the equivalent of a, a year or two of therapy. I went for, to my first one about 12 years into working with my current psychotherapist, the one that I still work with today. I was skeptical about what it could add to what was already going on in my sessions with what I would argue is the, the greatest therapist that I've ever met, my therapist. And I was shocked because the content was new, the information was new, but the experience of it was absolutely profound and life-changing. So our next offering is July 24th through 28th in Midway, Utah. Everything is included in that. Contact admissions at evoketherapy.com if you're interested. With that, let's get right to the pre-submitted questions for this evening. Somebody writes this, my, currently my son has been dating for two years and living together for five years. It seems like they are serious and committed. I was listening to a psychologist saying that living together was kind of like a fake relationship. I actually think I answered this question last time, so I'm going to skip it. We'll just edit that out of there, Maddie, when I do the podcast uh, audio so we, we, we don't have that on there. Okay. So the first person writes, how do you treat children with severe ADHD and impulse control issues? Um, well, first of all, it's really important that you get a psychological assessment because ADHD is often misdiagnosed or other things are diagnosed uh, in place of ADHD. It could be mood disorders, could be anxiety, could be executive functioning, which, which overlaps some but doesn't quite parallel it and to see if medication, stimulants specifically, or other medication might be effective. So we believe that that for people that, that are diagnosed with ADHD, that can be a part of the solution. I'm not saying it has to be a part of the solution for everybody, but oftentimes that is a part of the solution. And then just like any issue, you have to be aware of it. You have to be able to advocate for, for yourself. You have to be able to make accommodations. You have to know what your blind spots are. I, I talk about this all the time. When somebody walks into a 12-step meeting and announces to the group when, when it's their turn to speak and says, hi, my name is Joe. I'm an alcoholic. What they're saying is, I understand my limitations. I know what, what I'm vulnerable to. I know what my risks are. And the same is true of, of ADHD. You have to know... Um, how you best work. You have to know what kind of conditions help you to focus. You have to, have to, like I said, be able to advocate for yourself. You have to create schemas or, or patterns or, or ways to operate. The, the, I think the most difficult thing to think about when it comes to ADHD is that when it goes undiagnosed or if there's a lot of shame around it, 
it can hugely affect self-esteem. There's an estimate that, that I read some years ago that the average child with ADHD experiences 20,000, 20,000 more critical comments than the other students of their cohort. That is phenomenal. And, and I know cases where adults who haven't been diagnosed have struggled in multiple areas of their life and, and it's because they weren't aware of it. So you have to know what works for you. You have to know how to accommodate and the world isn't built for neurologically diverse people. There are lots of gifted, lots of successful examples of those with ADHD from the past. I've heard I've talked about with Einstein and Mozart and, and many others, actors and actresses. One of my favorite actresses, Audrey McDonald, on Broadway, when she received her last Tony Award, one of the things that she said during her acceptance speech was, I'm grateful that my parents put me in theater as opposed to putting on, me on medication. And she got a lot of flack for that because people heard her as saying that being put on medication is the wrong idea, which then she responded to them and said, it wasn't that. But the fact of the matter is, is there can be certain activities, certain professions, certain learning uh, situations and contexts where they cater to people with neurodiversity and ADHD, and they're aware of what kind of accommodations that people need. So how you treat it is you treat it like any other issue with, with somebody. You, 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 you get past the shame. You, you work through the shame of it so that the person can be honest with themselves about who they are. And I have weaknesses. I have strengths, just like I'm sure everybody watching and listening does. And it's critical that we understand what those are. That's part of growing up. That's part of maturity. That's part of healing. So you have to experience love. You have to experience the subsequent feeling of self-love. And then you have to work on looking at yourself honestly and understanding who you are. So it's like therapy for any other thing, any other issue in those ways. Uh, and then you, 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 you talk about the different kinds of schemas and then learning assistance and accommodations that need to be made. But mostly you're just talking about somebody understanding who they are. And that's a critical feature, feature when it comes to any kind of mental health or any kind of healing. Thanks for the question. Somebody writes, I'm lost on boundaries. My 21 year old son went to evoke at age 17 and spent the last five years numbing the impact of his father's decline and death from alcoholism. Then the perceived rejection betrayal he experienced from his peers as he was trying to navigate his grief, grief while hoping life would get better after his father died. He struggled with anorexia, tech and marijuana addictions. He is very clear he doesn't want to live or get better. I've been trying to stop enabling him with his recent admission, I am lost. He's terrified of the void. If he stops smoking, scrolling, what should I do next? Obviously, I, I can't get very specific about what you should do next. And, and please, this goes for you and anybody who's watching or listening, please try to be kind to yourself about what might be enabling or rescuing. And I'm not sure that we're even always right about that. I think sometimes we can be very critical and harsh judges of ourselves. And sometimes what I have learned as a father and a therapist is that sometimes the, the right thing to do isn't always popular among other professionals or other, the, other folks. So the, the answer to the question is that you maintain a practice and a discipline of your own recovery. If you are prone to enabling, if you are prone to rescuing, it's critical that you be involved in a process, a therapeutic process, a 12 step group where you're looking at that on a daily basis, on a continual basis. I was asked, and, and, and again, I mentioned that I can't really answer what you should do next. It's, it's, it's not even my inclination when I have clients in therapy. I, I say this to clients all the time. I, I don't give advice. The advice doesn't really make sense in the kind of psychotherapy that, that, that we do, that I do. We can give you tools. We can give you skills. We can present to you ideas, concepts. We can help you see things that you can't see. Most importantly, we can reflect back a, a sense of love and compassion and non-judgment so that ultimately you can internalize that. And, and when you internalize that, then you're able to see yourself more and more clearly. But 
what I would say is the same thing that I said to a group of professionals where I was teaching some years ago, teaching a codependency course, uh, a lecture. I was actually called to step in at the last minute by somebody that, that had to opt out at the last minute for personal reasons. And because I was capable of teaching the subject on a moment's notice, I stepped in. And when I was teaching, one of the psychologists, one of the women in the audience asked me, she said, Brad, how can you suggest to us that we kick our adult son out of our house who's using drugs when the possibility is, or, or tell our clients to do that, when the possibility is that that child could die? How can you recommend to us, how can you suggest to us that we tell families and parents to kick their children out of the house when the possibility is that they might die? And I paused and, and, and I said, I'm sorry if I communicated that, that's my mistake. I would never tell a parent what to do, especially in a situation like this. And you're describing a similar kind of situation where the stakes are really high. You're talking about self love. Uh, you're talking about self care and self love, and his losing his will to to live. So, please, please, don't abdicate the responsibility onto somebody else. Do what you feel best with, because if the worst thing happens, you have to live with that. What I said to this woman was, I would help this, this family, whoever it was, this parent that you're talking about hypothetically, I would help them to heal their codependency and then they would decide what to do. And that's really the way that I think about it. So when I ask, when, you, when I get asked the question, what should I do next? My answer is work on your codependency, work on your boundaries, work on your self-care. One of the biggest shifts, the simple, and there's a lot of ways to talk about this, and I could probably finish this sentence in a variety of ways. But one of the simplest shifts, shifts that happens when people move from active codependency to, to recovery in codependency is they begin to make decisions based on what's good for them. They begin to make decisions on what feels best. They begin to make decisions on taking care of themselves. And that might sound, that does sound to so many people like selfishness, like, like, self-indulgence and it's not we, we we know we understand that self-care is the 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 predisposing activity feature idea that that leads to love you can only love people to the extent you love yourself and, and what you're essentially going to have to do i was talking to my wife about this the other day in anticipation of a speaking engagement that I have, I was talking to my wife about, you know, sometimes I just want to get up and, and tell people, you know, it's all about guilt and shame. If you can get rid of the shoulds and the shouldn'ts and the rights and the wrongs and the goods and the bads, you can heal. You can look at yourself. You can be honest with yourself. You can understand yourself. You, you can actually love others a lot more when you get rid of all those constructs. But if I were to come into a meeting and to say that to people, they would think I was crazy. What, what does my shoulds and shouldn'ts, my, my internalized uh, sense of, of what's right and what's wrong, good and bad, what does that have to do with my question as a parent, which is what's the right amount of screen time? But in recovery from codependency, we, we move away from the right answer, the good answer versus the bad answer, and we move into our answer. See, all of the stories, all of the motifs that, that speak to this, this heroic journey. They, they move from right and wrong into what it means to be a self. Who am I? To be human, really. So it might sound really convoluted and philosophical, but the fact of the matter is we, we've got to work on our codependency. I, I work on it continually. I am codependent. I struggle with all the things that you guys struggle with probably some more than some of you, and some, of course, less than some of you. But I struggle with that constantly, continually. And I've accepted that that's my work and that I have to maintain a practice, a, a discipline to, to heal from that and continue to look at that. When somebody in, in mental health and treatment, when somebody... I found this on the web. Oh, Siri's talking to me. When somebody fantasizes that they can be cured of something, whatever it is, depression, anxiety, codependency, alcoholism, it's oftentimes breeding ground for denial. 
contrast that when somebody accepts that they, because of what they came with genetically and because of how they were raised, you know, the soup that they were cooked in, when they accept what their limitations are, they're free. You're right. They're not at war with themselves and with themselves anymore. They accept themselves for who they are. Our children and our partners and our employees and our friends, ideally, don't need us to be good or perfect. And you're never going to completely resolve all of your issues. If you wait to resolve all of your issues, your, your last breath is going to be taken before you realize that that was an impossible idea. The idea is to be you. To understand who you are, to understand what limitations you have, what proclivities, what vulnerabilities, what susceptibilities you carry in your personality. And everybody has some. Everybody has some, some of those. And one of the ways that you know this to be true is because the wisest people that we ever hear talk and teach spiritual, psychological lessons talk about their faults on a consistent basis. The people that don't go to therapy or haven't been to therapy, they're more likely to talk about how good they are and how they don't really have any mental illness or, or addictions. And that's just that's just not the way the world works. So long answer to, to say, continue to work on yourself and you get to decide. And if you were my client, I would walk beside you. And if I saw that there was a blind spot, just like a sponsor could do for you, I would ask you questions to see more clearly. But in the end, you get to decide. And you get to live with or have to live with the consequences. And at the end of the day, it's really important to understand that it's as tough as this is to imagine, but it's important. It's fundamentally important in the role of a parent. So you have to come to realize that you're in charge of your own happiness, even when you have a struggling child. At a baseline level, you're responsible for your happiness, for your well-being, for your serenity. And again, if you outsource that onto the child, if you subscribe to the old adage that you're only as happy as your least happy child, you place upon the child a great burden, a burden that, that nearly for all children is too heavy to bear. So do your work, do your work, do your work. Not because it's going to give you the answer, but it's going to give you your answer and it's going to give you the peace of mind that you need to be able to be able to make it in most situations in most equations to be able to make a decision when there is no right decision. It's just your decision. In fact, I was just thinking about this. Since I, I, I don't see a lot of questions, I'm going to read this, this quote to you that I saw. I've shared with, with, with you on the podcast once, but I really love it. It's from a psychoanalyst named Marie Louise von Franz. And she said, Jung has said, Carl Jung has said that to be in a situation where there is no way out or to be in a conflict where there is no solution is the classic beginning of the process of individuation. It is meant to be a situation without solution. The unconscious wants the hopeless conflict in order to put ego consciousness up against the wall so that the man has to realize that whatever he does is wrong, whichever way he decides will be wrong. This is meant to knock out the superiority of the ego, which always acts from the illusion that it has the responsibility for the decision. When you come to a point in life, and I think that's, the gift of parenting, one of the many gifts of parenting, when you realize that there's no right answer, that whatever you do is wrong. That, according to Carl Jung, is the, the moment of differentiation. In other words, the moment of becoming who you are. So, children are the one area in life that, that, that we care about so much, more than anything, arguably that we are sure to fail at over and over and over again, no matter who you are. And if you, you fantasize that you can win or come out on top or do it all right, I think that's why we end up with the kids that we end up with sometimes. I know that's, that's true for me. And sitting where I sit 
That's true for a lot of the parents that I've worked with. So thanks for the question. Somebody writes, I've heard you talk about how Evoke uses attachment theory. Can you explain what that is and how it helps participants and their families? Great question. Attachment theory essentially is the study of the relationship between the, the child and the parent. And, you, you know, simple attachment theory, when you hear people talk about attachment theory, they're usually talking about styles or qualities of attachment. They'll talk about a secure attachment. That's the, that's the ideal one. Secure attachment is uh, a safe parent, a parent who sees the child, who's attuned to the child, a parent who's able to regulate themselves, who's able to, the, the word is contain, but that sounds strange to most people, to hold space for. The child can throw a tantrum and the parent can remain calm. The child can be overwhelmed with anxiety and stress and the parent can, can take that, that feeling in, whatever it is, anger, sadness, di distress, and metabolize it and then reflect back to the child a sense that the child is okay and safe. That's a secure attachment a parent who's big enough to hold the child, who's a safe base. And, and if that happens throughout childhood, th then the child walks around with a sense of security, right? They can go back to themselves. They can tolerate distress. They're okay. I've said this with my therapist. I didn't grow up with a secure attachment. And, and when you accomplish it through therapy or other activities in adulthood, they call that secure attachment earned attachment. So when I was describing my own earned attachment with my therapist, the way I describe it is she has sat with me through distress, through depression, through anxiety, through suicidal ideation, through all kinds of problems and issues. And she has sat there capably, empathically, non-judgmentally, reflected back to me, even when I was being ridiculous. And that happens a lot. She's reflected back to me a sense that I'm okay that the world is a safe place. And because she sat with me, now I can sit with me. Now when something in the world happens that's distressing to me, objectively speaking, I know that I'm okay. And, and I'm a, I, I love, I love getting older in this way. I don't like all of it, of course, but I love getting older because I feel better and better and better the older I get. And I still participate in therapy. So that's secure attachment. That's earned attachment. Then there's anxious avoidant. That's my style growing up. Anxious avoidant is where when there is stress, when I feel threatened, I go away. And you'll recognize this pattern in people. So anxious attachment styles are I go away. I see rejection a mile away. I, I'm hypervigilant. I read the room. I'm looking for threats. I pull into a parking lot. I joke about this. I pull into a parking lot with my new car, if I had a new car, and I know where the safest place to park is so I won't get a door ding. We joke about that in my family. Right? When we go up to the drive through window at a fast food restaurant, I want the order ahead. I'm always getting everything right, and anything that's threatening, my, my strategy is that I go away. I, I leave. Then there's anxious ambivalent. That's the third style. Anxious ambivalent is somebody who clings. My wife has that style. When she feels the stress, she gets closer. She clings on. And it's not uncommon at all for an anxious avoidant like myself to end up with an anxious ambivalent. So people under distress, people under threat will cling on to people. My my mistake that I make as an anxious avoidant is I abandon people. My wife's mistake as an anxious ambivalent is she is intrusive, doesn't give people space. So when we get in an argument, I want to walk away. And of course, she doesn't want me to walk away. So we have to figure that out. We have to do that work. So that's secure or earned. Same thing. It's just when you get it. Anxious ambivalent, which is that anxious, kind of classically anxious, clingy, Person, person has a hard time saying goodbye, saying no, um, letting somebody have their space. That's anxious ambivalent. Anxious avoidant, that's my style. That's the abandoning, run away, go, go hide. Don't even let the rejection happen. 
uh, anticipate it happening and then get away before it happens. And then there's something called disorganized, which is when people grow up in a chaotic childhood and they don't even talk about that very much because such a small percentage of children experience that level of disorganization in their attachment style. So that's what people usually talk about when you talk about attachment theory. But what I'm talking about, what we're talking about evoke is how did you grow up? How did your parents deal with anger when you had it? How was fear dealt with in your family? How was sadness dealt with in your family? How was conflict dealt with in your family? How was success? How was failure dealt with in your family? You, you get shaped by your environment and the, the principal people, the principal factors in your childhood are your parents. In fact, I'm wearing this shirt today, this, this Evoke shirt. I've worn it before to a webinar. Freud, Jung, Bowlby, and Campbell. Bowlby was the, considered the father of attachment theory. He, did, he talked about these styles and, and how children use parents as a base of operation from which to go and explore the world, how safe they feel in the world. But, but really, it's about the fact that human beings are shaped by their context, which makes sense because we are social creatures. Right? We, we have a genetic makeup that, that causes us to, to need to and to want to be in relationship with others like a homing device almost that attracts us to other people. So whatever style you grew up with, which is your attachment style, whichever, whatever your family was like, that's oftentimes the, the, the style that you'll look for in the world. So when your children go out and date people and start bringing them home and you have thoughts and opinions about those people, that can be a reflection of the style, right? That can be a reflection of the, the style or maybe something that was missing, but we, we think that children are, of course, genetically loaded to come with certain predispositions. That's a fact. I say this all the time, that people that claim that it's all nature or all nurture are just silly. In fact, common sense, the very simplest common sense tells us that that's not true, that it's not all one thing or the other. So children are born with genetic predispositions, gifts and resources and limitations and styles of thinking and learning and so forth, temperaments. And then the environment has its way and it shapes you. And even children that come from the same home might have different attachment styles because that's their way of coping. But some things in the family remain consistent, like how the family dealt with failure or how the family dealt with mistakes or anger or sadness, like I mentioned before. So we think that the parents, you you folks, the most of the people that listen to this, we think you were shaped by your childhood. Before you met your children and before you had your children and then that shape that you took on to deal with your childhood becomes the way that you shape your children in some ways. Attachment theory is best explained in the opening page of the book, The Drama of the Gifted Child, in my opinion, the most important book in my lifetime that's been written about child, children and child development, where Dr. Alice Miller says that, that we have only one fight in our, in our experience, we have only one fight in our battle against mental illness, and that is the discovery of the unique emotional history of our childhood. And the research is absolutely abundant and clear understanding your childhood not fixing it doesn't matter if it was good or bad really but understanding it is the greatest predictor in other words self-awareness is the greatest predictor of your ability to parent well and so while it is absolutely tempting and draws us to, to want to figure out what our child's problem is and fix it, it's really an invitation to fix us. Our children just expose our undone work. They expose our emotional immaturity. So when I say go to therapy, when I say go to 12 steps, I'm not saying that you're going to go there and they're going to give you the, the, the secrets, the, the manual on how to fix your child. They're going to give you the manual, manual on how to fix you, how to heal you, who you are. And from that place, everything else starts to make sense. Remember, I teach that, that the child 
is the teacher and the parent is the student. And if you get that right, everything makes sense. But if you think you're the teacher and you've got it figured out and you're here to, obviously we have to teach our children some things, but, but fundamentally, spiritually, if you fall into the trap of believing that you're the teacher and you're here to teach children how life is, it's going to be rough for both of you. So attachment theory is understanding child development, really. Principally in the context of the primary parent relationship. And long before I even thought that I would be studying attachment theory and, and, and developing a program and a curriculum based on it, my doctoral dissertation was looked at childhood trauma and what, if anything, in the family system could mitigate it. And what we found is, which is consistent with the research across cultures, across socioeconomic research from all over the world, what, what my dissertation showed confirmed what the, what the attachment research teaches, which is that if somebody in, in your childhood was consistently present and saw you, saw who you were, which meant they had a good sense of self themselves, they had healed themselves, they had self-awareness themselves. If you had a, an adult that was consistently in your life that saw you, the trauma had no effect on you in terms of the outcome variable of healthy, and the variable that we looked at was healthy dating relationships. So it didn't matter if you came from divorce, didn't matter if you had a parent that was an alcoholic. What mitigated that is having a secure attachment. If you want more on this, the best book on this is Parenting from the Inside Out. The best book that I know is Parenting from the Inside Out from Daniel Siegel and, and Mary Hartzell. It's a great read, both the, the science and the anecdotal information is all throughout there and it's well grounded in the research. So that's what we mean about attachment theory. I'll say one more thing before I move off this topic. Um, the, the most important thing in therapy, if you work from an attachment-based model, is the relationship between the therapist and the client. How I feel about the client. Just like how I feel about my children. My books are both based on attachment theory. How I feel about my children is how they will come to think about themselves. If I see them as a problem, that message will get through, that energy, that, that will get through, and they'll see themselves as a problem. So in therapy, we, we look to repair attachment wounds, att attachment fractures by the way we feel about our clients, how we respond to them. Right? Like when I was confessing something 15 years ago to my therapist that I'd done, I forget what it was, and I was ashamed of it, stumbling, stuttering, to confess that to my therapist. I wrote about this in, in The Audacity to Be You. My therapist paused me and said, Brad, I don't think you understand what's going on here. If you came in to therapy and told me you were in love with a chicken, she said, I would assume you have a good reason and I would just want to understand why. And I remember hearing that moment. She said, said it a little bit different than that, but I remember hearing that idea and I thought, I've never been in a room like this. I've never been with an adult like this before. And I ended up confessing the thing that I was struggling to confess and, and it led to healing. So attachment based therapy says, yes, there are tools and techniques and skills that come out in therapy. All of that is true, but the most important medicine, is the relationship between the therapist and the client. That's what attachment-based therapy says. That the therapist becomes the parent that you did not have. I'm quoting Jamie Gill. That the therapist becomes the parent that you did not have and therapy becomes the childhood that you did not have. I get asked a lot by therapists, but what if you only have brief contact? What if you only know the client for you know, a couple of months or even a couple of hours? And what I say to them is it can make a difference if somebody sees you. My sixth grade teacher is somebody who made a difference in my life and I just had him for one year of my life. And we've kept in contact to this day. My great aunt Catherine, 
I only met for one day. And I'll never forget how I felt when I was with her, how I felt seen by her. I felt like she treated me like a person. I, I named one of my children after her, one of their middle names because of that, that one day. I've had interactions with people where they've, they've come to me later on and said that they felt seen by, by me. One of the greatest things that has happened to me in 2024, I've shared this before at my daughter's wedding just a month ago, was that several people when they were getting up to, to give a toast said to my daughter and to her husband that they felt seen by them. But you have to, you have to have a secure base to see people. You have to, you have to deal with your fear. You have to deal with your anxiety. You have to deal with your shame and your guilt. So that's what attachment-based therapy is. It's beyond just the, the four styles. And it's understanding that the, that the real substance is the relationship. <clears throat> Excuse me. Somebody writes, can you provide studies of efficacy of wilderness therapy? Actually, if you go to our website, you can read all of those. We have, in fact, Maddie, if you're able to pull that up and put the link in the box on, on the page on research. At one point, we were considered by many to, to have done more research in, in wilderness therapy than all other wilderness therapy programs combined. That has changed for sure. There's a lot more research on wilderness therapy, but you can look at our website. We have some of the greatest resources, both, both created and published by our own therapist and Dr. Matt Hoyt, my partner, who is an expert researcher. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, people from across the field. But remember, it's really attachment theory and attachment-based therapy in nature, right? It's experiential and and camping in small groups is the experience that replicates the, the, the home. So when you think about efficacy of wilderness therapy, and, and there are, there's research to support it, really what you're talking about is that's the delivery method, but the therapy is traditional therapeutic thought and theory. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm still getting over that cold that I had last week. Are there any other questions, Maddie? Or is that it for today? Well, while Maddie's looking up that link, I'll go to our upcoming announce. Oh, looks like there's another one that just came in. Somebody says, I listened to my 19-year-old vent over a FaceTime call. I was a container until he called me a name and started attacking me. He wanted money and blamed me for not supporting him, even though we are financially and emotionally. My husband said I should have hung up on him earlier, and I made him more upset by listening to him. I have heard, I've heard this before from my husband, and it is frustrating since I'm letting my son vent, but without being abused. I try to explain being a container to your child when you can, but it seems if my son is upset, which he often is, and tries to dump on me. It is somehow my fault since my son says he is mad at me, despite me not engaging, but only listening and trying to understand up to a point. Sorry, let me read that last sentence again. Is it somehow my fault since my son said he is mad at me and despite me not engaging, but only listening and trying to understand up to a point? Containing is something you do when you can. And it's something you don't do when you can't. So if you're okay listening, listen. And if you feel abused, if it starts to wear on you, you're allowed to hang up the phone. You're allowed to be done. But see, when we think about containing, we're not trying to change the other person. If the goal is to get him to not be mad and not blame you, you're probably leaking that. And that's probably what your husband wants in this story. I had a father some time years ago. I didn't use the word containing at the time, but I was just talking about listening. And 
he said he was talking to his daughter and he practiced the skill of active listening perfectly according to the script and after after that he said she was still mad his daughter was still upset with him his young adult daughter so he looked at me after sharing the story and said essentially so you see it didn't work and my response is do you hear it yet you were still trying to get her to not be mad so let me talk about it in, in, in the kind of thinking that goes into this story, your story, it goes like this. I don't care if he blames me. I'll, I'll talk in the first person. That's neither here nor there. I know myself. I know my faults. I know that I contributed to my children's, my child's neuroses. That's what all parents do. Carl Jung said parents must be mindful of the fact that it is they who are the principal cause of neurosis in their children. I believe that. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to pay for it for the rest of my life. At some point, the growing up is you have to figure out your wounds. Yes, parents dent their children. Yes, we, we impact our children negatively. We all do. It happened to me from my parents, right? My mother, I could tell you, from my father's abandonment to my mother's depression, I could tell you very clearly the ways in which they dented me. And they're real. And it's, they're my dents now. They're worthy of my exploration and, and my attention and definitely worthy of healing, but they're mine. So you can listen to your children all that you want. And you can stop listening to your children any time you want. Codependency isn't always being a container. Codependency is being yourself. So I want you all to hear, I'm not teaching you when I talk about containing or listening or various things. I'm not saying this is the right thing to do. I'm saying this is what it is. This is how it works. But I have to tell you, codependency means saying no just as often as saying yes. And al -Anon, they teach you that no is a complete sentence. That's one of the slogans that they use. So you're allowed to hang up anytime you want. It sounds like your husband is triggered. He's probably triggered because you're hurt. And yes, listening to, to people sometimes seems to fan the flames of their anger. It's almost like they've been given a, a, a stage to express their anger or their hurt. Or their complaints and when that stage is in the spotlight is afforded them it gets bigger that's okay that happens to me you know if my wife apologizes for something that she did i sometimes will then express my anger more more vociferously vociferously vociferous if that's a word i know vociferous is i don't know if vociferously is i'll explain it more i'll talk about it more so don't think that when I talk about doing something that I'm telling you what you should do or the right thing to do. That's the exact opposite of what I'm talking about all the time. It's not that we listen to our children and we just tolerate the hurt and the pain that they, that they sling at us. As we heal, we talk to our children because we can. You know what it is? We talk and listen to our children because we, we've come to know ourselves more. The reason I can listen to people more than I used to be able to 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, is because I know who I am. So, so more so, not, not perfectly, but more so. So what you say about me has nothing to do with me. I learned this recently. People can only meet me or you. People can only meet us at the level of their own consciousness. And so what they think and feel about us is not necessarily about us. So you contain when you can. You contain because you, you love somebody and you know that sometimes giving them an audience is, is what heals them. But at the same moment, you realize that their anger is not your responsibility. 
you might have dented them. You, if they're your child, you for sure did. But that's not a life sentence that you have to carry. It's not about listening and tolerating the absolute pain. It's about after a while, it doesn't hurt when they tell you how they feel. That's the magical moment. You're not repressing the pain that you feel. You're not swallowing it. It doesn't hurt when they talk to you about those things. So take care of yourself. Hang up when you want to. Listen when you want to. Let him be angry as long as he wants to. But first and foremost, it is imperative. If we want to be a part of this, this healing process, it's imperative that we learn to take care of ourselves. First and foremost. You can only love somebody to the extent that you love yourself. You can only love others to the extent that you love yourself. And there are no exceptions. The relationship that we have with ourselves is the template uh, upon which all other relationships are built. So thank you for the question. And thank you for the link, Maddie. Is that the last question? I have time for one more if there are any others. Any more? No more? Maddie, any? No. That's it. All right, folks. Thanks for the questions. We encourage all current parents to try six of any of the following 12 step support groups alanon.org, coda.org, familiesanonymous.org, adultchildren.org. You can also go to refugerecovery.org, which is a Buddhist inspired recovery program or the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI.org, for free classes and resources in your local community. We've also recently... Just getting my throat hydrated. Recently, we've also partnered with other parents like me. If you want a one-month free premium membership, use the code FINDINGYOU. Other Parents Like Me is an online platform built on the foundation of parents supporting parents, 17 weekly Zoom meetings designed for caregivers of teens and young adults facing mental health challenges, led by trained peer parent facilitators. It's an authentic and safe community where parents actively engage, support each other, and find valuable resources. My two books, The Journey of the Heroic Parent and The Audacity to Be, which are both all about attachment theory, are available on Amazon and Audible. Like I mentioned earlier, if you want to, to know, in my opinion, after 30 years of doing this, What's the best thing that you can do for yourself, for your marriage, for your child? It's to attend an intensive. And if you don't want to go to ours, if, if it's a conflict of interest and you think he's just selling a product, go to OnSite. Go to the Meadows Survivors Program. Go to the Guest House at Ocala. Go to Bridge to Recovery. Go to somewhere else where they do the same kind of work. Like I mentioned earlier, July 24th through 28th is the next in-person offering. And um, June 21st, which is just coming up, we have a three-day online version of it. This is also available for free to all current alumni parents, or excuse me, current evoked parents. July or June 21st through 23rd is the next offering. If, and if you don't want to go to that and you'd rather go if you're a current parent, you'd rather go to the in-person one, you can apply the cost of the online intensive to your in-person intensive. I will be in New York City on July 31st through August 4th. That's filling up already. I think there's a couple of spots left. This will be the only Finding You that I will be running in 2024, July 31st through August 4th, just outside of the city. And then I'm going to be hosting a Finding Connection workshop with my wife, Michelle. We love doing these. These are for couples who want to do their own work together. So if you thought about doing it and you want to come to a Finding You, the Finding Connection workshop is that offering. There's only one couples spot left September and it's all the way out in September September 25th through 29th if it fills up maybe we'll open up a second one you can also find uh, custom intensives for couples co-parents and families go to our website use the QR code or email intensives at evoketherapy.com we have support groups for current and alumni families June 20th at 7 p.m. is that next next offering once a month we have an alumni only meeting July 15th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time is that offering. And then for our intensives and coaching clients, 
we have July 8th, 6 p.m. Mountain Time is your support group. Email us at supportgroups at evoketherapy.com. Use the QR code or go to the website. If you would like to be hooked, if you'd like to be connected to a coach who has been trained in the attachment-based model, the model that I've been teaching about tonight, you can contact coaching at evoketherapy.com and match up with one of our coaches that can do therapy coaching with you all over the world. All these broadcasts are available on Spotify or your favorite podcast. Just, just go to Spotify, your favorite podcast, and search Finding You and Evoke Therapy Podcast. Or you can go to soundcloud.com on your computer and search Evoke Therapy, uh, Finding You there, and you can listen there. You can also go to Evoke's YouTube channel and watch the video rebroadcast with all of my coughs, my water drinking. We don't edit those. Those are available on Evoke's YouTube channel. You can find Evoke Therapy programs and meet Dr. Brad Reedy on X, Threads, and Instagram using the handles at Evoke Therapy and at Dr. Brad Reedy, respectively. And of course, the Evoke Intensives also has an account on Instagram. Just use the handle at Evoke Therapy Intensives. On Facebook, you can find us by searching Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives. And then our blog has wonderful content. I'm really excited about the next broadcast this Thursday at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. I'm going to be talking about mindfulness and therapy based on the book by the Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh, Thich Nhat Hanh called Mindfulness and psychotherapy. So I'm really looking forward to that. I love this idea. I think it it bridges for those of us who, who find mindfulness to be a little bit far out there. It really brings it home practically. You can always send questions. You can send requests of slides, uh, requests for topics to webinar at evoketherapy.com. Email us there. Your questions will go at the top of the queue. As always, I hope this was a helpful point of contact. And for on behalf of the people that you love, and the people that love you, thanks for showing up and being willing to do your work. It makes all the difference in the world. Have a great evening, and I'll talk to you on Thursday night. Take care. Bye-bye.